so I'm Jason uh, for the uh, audience at home, uh, former Hocus faculty. Um, this is my Twitter handle, so please feel free to send me questions. And today we're going to talk about the, um, the topic of pyloric stenosis, which has been evolving over the last five years um, from obscurity to, uh, to renewed relevance, much like this logo. All right, <laughs> bringing it back to Bob. Oh, man. So today's objectives. So the objectives of today are to recognize the advantage of POCUS for use in assessment of suspected pyloric stenosis, plus to demonstrate the impact of POCUS on downstream care. And um, like I start every lecture, I think it's important just to remember the advantages that POCUS gives us as a whole. So it allows us to see anatomy that we couldn't otherwise see. It gives us an extra piece of the puzzle along with our history and physical exam. And it allows us to do this in a timely fashion. And so it's, it's ideal for emergency providers. But to use all these applications well, you need to be able to acquire an image, you need to be able to interpret that image, you need to understand the limitations, and then you, be able, you need to be able to integrate it into your clinical practice. And with our particular application today, looking at pyloric stenosis, really the acquisition can sometimes be a little bit challenging. Uh, and then sometimes, depending on your site, the integration can be. And so I always show this picture of the world to remind me that our settings are different wherever we are. And we're going to talk kind of in a westernized context again today and talk about pyloric stenosis um, as we kind of do things here at Sick Kids. But depending on your relationships with your surgeons, depending on um, how your hospital processes function, this application may be used in different, different ways, especially if you have a rural setting. Um, so good. And so, but there is one thing that's kind of universal. I'm just going to ask the people here, how do we diagnose pyloric stenosis? It's not a trick question. Ultrasound, Ultrasound yeah. right? Ultrasound. Essentially, we don't really rely on our physical exam. Can't really rely on our history that much. They build some pretest probability, but the de facto kind of gold standard is ultrasound. So we're talking about taking the gold standard from the DI suite and moving it to the bedside. All right. As always, a bit of a throwback. So, what kind of probe do we use? What kind of transducer do we use for this application? Linear. Linear one. So, what's linear? What are the properties of it? Right, so high frequency. And what's the relevance of this picture? Is this a megaton? Ah, good guess. Anybody? Optimus Prime? No. Shockwave? No, sound wave. Oh. Sound wave. <laughs> Classic <laughs> Transformers. All right, so let's go through some cases to bring pyloric stenosis to life. Case one. Now you'll see I took a lot of time in these cases, developing them and making sure they were accurate to what you see at the bedside. So a six-year-old male comes in complaining that he's vomiting and it seems projectile. Six weeks. Six weeks. He's referred by his primary care provider to the ED. Does it sound like a kind of typical case? Yeah. All right. So what's the technique? Who wants to share with us a technique for looking at pyloric stenosis? And while we talk, I'm going to run this image that can kind of give us a bit some clues as to what we're, what we're doing. So, so it should be adjacent to the gallbladder. So you can find the upper abdomen. Um, find the stomach. Capture the measurements. Right. So it's kind of sub xiphoid, yeah. right? Your probe is transducer. That was the motion you were making for folks that couldn't see you. You're kind of by the gallbladder, which is by the liver edge. Mm -hmm. And what are you looking for initially? Sorry, maybe I missed that. I heard someone someone at, at home. Sorry, I can't see who's on my screen, but I think someone said stomach. So you can find that hypoechoic or hyperechoic, excuse me, outline of the stomach. And from that, you can trace that to the pylorus. So here in this particular image, you can see the liver, you can see the stomach border, and then you can see how you can trace it down to that pylorus. And here's just a, a representation of hypertrophic pyloric stenosis to give you a sense of where you're going to find that stomach border and how you're going to trace it down to where those walls are thickened and becoming obstructive. All right. 
Any questions about that? Okay. Now, today, this is all like a numbers game, right? And what are some of the key numbers? So what's the significance of this number? Greater than three millimeters. Muscle wall. Muscle wall thickness. So if it's bigger than that, then that's pathologic, correct? What's the significance of this number? Greater than 14 millimeters. Channel length. So lots of people use the clever high loric stenosis, 3.14 to think of muscle wall thickness and then channel. But the channel in older kids can be up to 19 millimeters. There's a little bit of wiggle room there in some of the literature, but this is kind of our point of care cutoff. Okay. So here we have uh, just a diagram with some with hypertrophic pyloric stenosis pointed out and then some measurements. And what do you think about where they've put the calipers here for muscle wall thickness, channel length? I'm sorry, you can't really see. This is meant to kind of talk about more about placement. I think I would measure the muscle wall only like on the hypochoid, like the, right. not the anechoid, like not the channel itself. So I think that I would do So the muscle. So some people do it kind of differently. Most of the time we think about measuring inside from hyperechoic wall to hyperechoic wall. So we do get all that hypoechoic muscle. But one of the things I think this brings up often, you know, you want to try to get a good image. You really want to take advantage of your freeze function. Most machines have the ability to go back and forth with frames and really find a good frame that allows you to measure and try to get the best channel measurement you can. We're going to come back to that in a minute. Here's another image you can see. Can everybody kind of see, again, going back to Michelle's point, where the gallbladder sits? So the gallbladder is there, the liver is there, and then you see the, the pylorus. And just by visualizing this, you would say this looks pretty big, correct? What do you think about how they've measured here? We need to divide the sections. <laughs> right, You'll right. You need the muscle wall thicknesses on each side. It's not the entire thing. Although what this does demonstrate is actually how large these are. If you look at what that initial measurement is, it's one and a half, almost one and a half centimeters. So these structures aren't small. But I wanted to do this just to just to demonstrate to you kind of the correct and incorrect ways to measure. So this is the image from the, the patient that we talked about in our case. So they were able to find pylorus. And what looks like, I think, if you visualize, it looks like hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. So then our providers took a still image, and measured the channel. What do you think of this channel measurement? Looks pretty good. I think so. And it's 2.14 centimeters. So is that big enough to be concerning? More than 14. Yeah. You know, where exactly is the end point um, to put the, the end of your calendar? So I think you do your best to find the inflection point um, where the pylorus begins and where it ends based on the muscle belly but I don't know if there's ever been something clearly defined other than kind of end to end. Um, I don't know if Mark has another thought about that. No, it's like the, um, the appendix finding the, getting that shot where you feel like the entire pylorus is a linear structure that's lying under your probe is tough. Mm -hmm. And often you'll have one clearly defined end and not the other. Also, my feeling doing these is that when you've got a pathologic one, it's like right yeah. there and you, you don't struggle with like, you start putting your line on it pretty quickly, crosses 14 millimeters, mm -hmm. and you're like, okay, so I'm done. And I can't be really accurate about whether it's 16 or 21 or 23, but it's 14 in one shot. So it's not often that part of it that we obscured by stomach, like air, and then you can't. It, it, it can be, but the more, uh, when you have a true pyloric stenosis, the more likely you have retained stomach secretions that outline one end really easily. Mm -hmm. 
here's another measurement of wall, a muscle wall thickness. One thing, um, just thinking again about measuring a, a structure that's a cylinder. Remember, to be the most conservative, we typically want to measure at its narrowest point because if you measure at the thickest point, there could be some error there based on the properties of a cylinder. And here you can see that they've done a measurement, again, well beyond what we would expect. And then there's also the consideration of measuring in the transverse plane, which could also be something to consider um, when it comes to muscle wall thickness if you're having some difficulty.